Hello and welcome to today's video. Healing goes so far beyond just not having symptoms anymore or having less symptoms or having better digestion or being able to tolerate more foods. Healing is like synonymous with your growth and expansion as an individual and your development as a, as a person on earth. And it's like this crazy spiritual process. It's a spiritual journey. It's your life. It's everything. There's nothing that isn't healing. Everything is healing. It's not just the physical stuff. It's not just less pain and inflammation, better sleep. It's feeling more confident. It's having a reason to get up in the morning and feeling like you actually want to be alive. It's having a family. This looks different for everybody. There's a million different ways to have a f meaningful or fulfilling life. And that's part of healing. Finding that is part of healing. And then doing it is part of healing as well. You know, you have to find it first. You have to define it, then you have to fulfill it. And this looks different for everyone. One way that I've found, I really like to look at this. This is, this is actually, this has been really helpful for me recently. So I'm not an astrologist an astrologer. I, I'll be honest, I hardly know anything about astrology, but I've had some pretty strong judgments. I've, I've found that this is one of the layers of healing that I found most, most difficult is judgments. And judgments are really interesting because they create a sense of separation between you and the rest of the world. And in some ways it's like a defense mechanism. Like we judge things in a way, often judgment comes from a place of us feeling not good enough. So we judge things as being worse than us or less than us so that we can feel better about ourselves. But it's actually coming from a place of insecurity. Very interesting. Kind of in this way ties a bit into narcissism. Narcissism is really connected to having a very low self-worth. So you do everything you can to control your external environment to feel powerful because you actually feel intrinsically very powerless or like you're very, very unable, very incompetent, very inadequate. But it pushes people, it, we push people away with it. And working on judgment has really had a profound impact in my life in one main tangible example that I can share with you. My breakthrough with food intolerances. So I, I was living on a really restricted diet for a really long time. I was basically existing on boiled beef, boiled salmon, raw egg yolks, olive oil and coconut oil, and cold pressed four times filtered kale juice. That's all I ate for about five years. And yeah, there were times where like, I tried like one thing or I tried another thing and like, but nothing ever worked. You know, I tried doing carnivore for a bit, for like four days, that did not work. That was terrible for me. I can remember I tried making pancakes using cricket flour and I had that in my diet for maybe two weeks. And then that also didn't work. I was like, oh, I'm constipated. If I can get some, some of these fibers, these are a carnivore fiber. You know, they're a different type of substance. Maybe this will work. Didn't work. So when I say I was on a diet of five foods for five years, I was trying quite desperately a lot of different things in the process on the road to, to try and heal. The core of my diet was those five foods and they're what really worked for me. They're what I tolerated. And what enabled me to have such a big breakthrough with foods and food intolerances. So we're talking like severe histamine intolerance, mast cell activation syndrome. We're talking sensitive to carbs, sensitive to basically everything. You know, I would have anything and I would have a reaction to like click of my fingers, like over overnight being able to tolerate gluten and dairy and fiber and sugar and lactose and everything just everything overnight and having no reactions and this came from changing my judgment i had this really strong judgment in my mind where i would look at food and i could only measure it through one metric through one lens and that was the only thing that matters about food is its nutritional content and how toxic it is so those five foods that i was eating were extremely high in nutrients extremely low in inflammatory molecules were they basically optimized for my digestion so basically I'm I'm judging all foods through one lens and saying like, this is the truth. This is the only way. For example, through this lens, I would say organic grass-fed beef is better in every dimension than, I'm gonna use McDonald's as the example because I think McDonald's gets a lot of judgment. You think about McDonald's and you think, oh, there's nothing good there. This is what facilitated this breakthrough for me. It was thinking about McDonald's and it was that I currently value food through this lens of nutrition versus inf inf inflammatory potential. But this is not the only truth. Truth. To me, this is very true right now. However, I'm one individual and there are thousands of other, other people, millions of other people that have different values to me, that have that value different things. And even myself as an individual, my hierarchy of values changes over time. So for example, when I'm traveling in the airport, I care way less about the food quality and more about not being hungry and about convenience and about availability and learning to add a new perspective, a new lens of what is valuable 
valuable in food caused this really visceral change in my perspective and it made me start looking at the world differently because a lot of my judgment of food of seeing this is the only way was dictated through a lot of trauma or a lot of warped perspective that I developed about my worldview and how the world should be instead of allowing the world to be as it is and as I've worked through changing my perspective instead of trying to change the world which is really hard I've actually changed my brain and I changed the way I think and the way that I see the world and consequently my body responds differently to the things that I do so this is a deep level of brain retraining this isn't what you do in a group program like the Gupta program or primal trust or things like this these kind of neural retraining programs are the way I see it is like you're trying to you're getting a cut you're putting a plaster you're getting a cut you're putting a plaster you're getting a cut you're putting a plaster it's like you keep finding the acute nervous system dysregulation and then you patch it and then you patch it and then you patch it what I'm talking about is completely changing how you see the cut to the fact that you actually move out of the way of it and it doesn't cut you anymore and you've completely rewired your brain and you see things completely differently that's how I had my breakthrough with foods don't know why I want to share that, that with you today but that's how I had my breakthrough that's when I stopped being histamine intolerant that's when I stopped having muscle activation syndrome it was when I changed what's happening in here and it was a hard process so here Kiara says how can I calm my mast cells so I can heal I can't tolerate anything at all pain in my stomach is terrible the not being able to breathe is a joke I'm really sorry that was I know, I know what that's like. I have many clients that have had this problem as well. I'm down to two foods, which are becoming a struggle too. Severe malnutrition and dysbiosis. Can't even eat meat protein. It's too much for me. That's really tricky. I think that the story that I was just telling you, maybe for you, I don't know that much about you. I don't know much about your individual situation. What I do know is when you get down to like when you've got mast cell activation syndrome, when you're down to eating two foods, when you're getting to the point where just being alive is like, when your symptoms are that bad, you can almost be like wishing to die. Like, and I've been there, you know, when I was on five foods, when I was basically laying in my bed 23 and a half hours a day, blind, unable to do anything. My whole existence was basically just trying to learn how to heal my health condition and then distracting myself by being in another reality, listening to audiobooks about fiction. You know, like I listened to Game of Thrones as an audiobook before I watched it because I would just try to immerse myself in another reality. And it's really funny when I was there, you know, I'm in this other visualizing, like I'm in the world of Game of Thrones and I'm at the wall in the north and, you know, Jon Snow is like, I don't know, he's like around up there or something. But what I, what I was really engaging with in that reality was like they were drinking mulled wine. And I was like, I've never had mulled wine. I really want to try it. I really want to know what it tastes like. And I was like imagining myself drinking it. And like, they're just talking about like, like bits of rabbit or like when you listen to the audiobook, it's a lot more like a survival experience than just a story. So it's like you hear about them eating the bread and then hunting the, the game and, and like sitting by the fire. And, and it's like, I was living a life in my head because I physically couldn't exist. Like physically my body was just like, I was basically dead. Like I couldn't, I didn't have a life. I didn't have any friends. I didn't have any, didn't see any of my family. I was basically just staying alive and I would just distract myself and live in this other reality. So when you've got someone that's in this kind of situation, there is almost always without exception either, and usually this is both, some kind of chronic toxicity. You know, I was living in mold at the time. So I don't know, Kiara, if you're living in mold or if you haven't checked for mold or if you haven't done, so you could do a, an organic acids urine test with a mycotoxin panel. See if you're living in mold, because if you are, nothing is gonna change until you change your environment and you're just gonna stay really stuck. And I don't want that for you. If that's not the case, you may have some other source of chronic toxicity. If it could be a, a dental infection or amalgam fillings, or maybe you have a lot of crops that get sprayed with pesticides. You know, I lived near some fields where that would happen. I don't think that was one of my major root causes, but you know, with, with the extent of water damage and mold in my house, that I know that was a huge factor. So we have to identify the chronic toxicity, whatever, whatever it is. This can also be non-physical. You know, if you live with a narcissist, if you are living in an environment where you chronically feel unsafe, if you are living in an environment that isn't supporting you into your natural state of expansion. You are supposed to be growing as an individual. You're supposed to be becoming more confident. You're supposed to be making more money. You're supposed to be feeling better. You're supposed to be growing. Like the universe is this expansive energy out. And if you're not in an environment that allows this energy to radiate out of you and to allow you to grow as an individual, that energy has to go somewhere and it gets compressed into you and it will manifest as disease. And I say this from experience because I mean, you can even go back and look at pictures of me, you know, looking like this, like skeleton, like complete, like not even alive, you know, super restricted, not eating enough, mold, water damage building, all the, all the root causes, trauma, um, unhealthy family dynamics, all of this big mess. And you look at me now, like you can see how my body, my energy is different. I 
can talk differently. Like I can groom myself differently, like physically, like I take up more space. I'm bigger, I can build muscle now. But these are all connected to all of these non-physical aspects that I've addressed. So the second thing is there's usually some kind of thought process that is maybe adaptive, maybe a better word, because we are like computer programs. We are like computers that are programmed, you know, going through our childhood and then through all of the life experiences that we have. We learn how the world works by the way that we experience the world. For example, like this is a really interesting phenomenon that I've seen. If you look at the children of wealthy individuals, it's very easy for them to come into money. It's very easy for them to make money or to get a high status job. And yes, there's obviously a physical component of like, well, if they have money, then they have more resources. They can make better connections. They have maybe get employed to their parents' company and blah, 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 and they get experience, et cetera, et cetera. But there's this kind of subconscious programming that happens where you learn how the world works. And this is especially true between the ages of zero and seven, but this is true all the time. You're always learning. As you get older, you become more able to distinguish between whether something that's happening to you is something that's personal or whether it's something that's happening outside of you. When you're zero to seven years old, you don't have that ability. Everything that happens around you is your fault. It's personal. You take it into your being. It's who you are. So if you experience that, for example, it doesn't matter how much you cry for help, no one ever comes. You're gonna grow up with a belief that like, there's no point in asking for help because you're never gonna get any because you never did when you were younger. But if you look at say children of wealthy individuals, they are always provided for and they just, they live their life in a way in alignment with this belief. And because they live the life that way, they end up getting the outcome. You know, if, if you believe that whatever happens you will be provided for, you're far more likely to take risks. You're far more likely to put yourself out there. You're far more likely to feel confident. And these are the traits that result in success and therefore you being provided for. If you're growing up, you learn you are helpless and you can ask for help as much as you want, but you ne it's never gonna come. You're never gonna get help. That's gonna, in a similar way, cause you to develop a belief system that in adulthood prevents you from actually even asking for help in the first place, which then denies you from you being able to receive help, which actually becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So when you're in a situation where you've got, where you're down to extremely restricted diet, like five foods or less, carnivore diet, mono meals, single foods, things like this, you've normally got two things going on chronic environmental toxicity and some kind of maladaptive thought pattern or thought process or belief about the world. And I think hearing that, first of all, can be kind of like disempowering. These are physical symptoms, you know, it's not just in my head. I'm not saying it's in your head, it's not. It's actually more more accurately, it's in your nervous system, more accurately. It's, it's more in your fascia, in your cellular memory. And it's also really important that you understand that it's actually not your fault because you didn't program yourself. The experiences that you had in childhood and the experiences that you have lived up until now that have been consequences of those experiences from childhood are your programming. And it's not your fault because you didn't program yourself. However, and this has been a really powerful statement for me, it's not your fault, but it is your responsibility. So even if it isn't your fault and it never was your fault and it actually it couldn't be your fault because it, it can't. The only person whose responsibility it is is your own because the only person that can actually change the situation is you. It's kind of like, imagine a, a computer that's programmed and as it grows, as it learns, it, it can start to look at its own circuitry. It can look at its own wiring and it can see like, oh, why have I wired like this? Like, this doesn't make any sense. I can change this wiring. And then you change the way that you think and you think differently, and then you operate as a different person. So it's not your fault, but it's your responsibility to change it from where it is to where you want it to be, if you wanna get the outcome that you wanna get. And very interestingly, this kind of ties back into this whole judgment piece, this whole talk that I was having initially about judgment. I always get this weird kind of, maybe like pain on my, maybe it's in my vocal cords, maybe my throat chakra is out of balance. I don't know. Sometimes we can have a symptom and it doesn't mean anything's wrong. And sometimes we can have a symptom and all we need to do is acknowledge that it's there and love it a little bit. And do I feel a little bit uncomfortable mas massaging my neck? Yeah, I feel pretty uncomfortable, but it's helping a lot. And sometimes that's what healing is. So it ties into this judgment piece again, being that you would maybe look at staying sick as a bad thing, but it's actually not. It's just one of many options and some people actually don't want to heal. And I'm not saying this of, of anyone, 
in particular, but I'm looking at this from an archetypal perspective of the energy. And what's really important is th this is really tricky because we're kind of breaking down this idea of like good and bad and seeing that there is actually no good or bad. There's a polarity to a situation of like black and white, yes and no, up and down, light and dark, but there's no good and bad. There's just different. So some people actually don't want to heal. For some people, it's actually in their best interests not to heal. And I'm gonna give you a personal example. So my illness for a very long time enabled me to stay weak and to stay powerless. And I had an experience in my family, and I'm not saying this from a place of blaming, of judgment, of guilting. I'm just, this is just the situation that happened. You know, I'm working on resolving these issues inside of myself, but I was in a family situation where if I were to be a powerful individual, if I were to do, to harness my anger energy and express it in any way possible, be that in a in an unhealthy way, like rage, like uh, passive aggression, or in a healthy way, like self-confidence, strong boundaries, self-worth, whatever this may look like. This would cause conflict with an individual in my family unit. And this conflict was so potentially dangerous to me that it threatened and jeopardized my survival. So my body loving me as much as it does, and my subconscious mind being as intelligent as it is, said, okay, this is a really interesting situation that we need to survive. Survive. The best way that we can survive would be to take this energy, to take this anger in its healthy aspects, self-confidence, self-worth, boundaries, this drive, this passion, you know, I'm sitting here doing a, recording a video, like, do you know how much like solar plexus energy, how much positive anger energy it takes to go out into the world or go out into this online universe and be like, here I am. It takes a lot. It's really hard or the negative aspects, but my body said, this is a dangerous energy for you to have in your environment. What we're going to do is we're just going to take it and we're going to hide it from you. And we're going to push it down and hold it in the stomach, hold it in the intestines. And this was adaptive. Looking back on this, like at the time I was, I was beating myself up. I was like, why am I so weak? Why am I so skinny? Why can't I digest any food? Why is my body abandoning me? Why is it sabotaging me? Why is it stopping me from healing? Why is this happening to me? And you can see how all of these are powerless statements. What I actually needed to stay alive in that situation was powerlessness. Because when I was powerless, I was not a threat. I was not a target. It took the target off my back and I could just exist and I could stay alive. So when you start looking at it like this, it's like, would healing be a good thing in this situation? No, it wouldn't because it would put me in danger. And your body and your subconscious mind, they care more about survival than about your happiness. They will do whatever it takes for you to stay alive. And if this means developing a chronic illness, if this means developing symptoms. If this means anything, then your body will do it because it loves you and it wants you to stay alive. But this programs you, this develops a type of programming. This forms a, a belief system. This forms a, a worldview. This forms a, a structure of being, a default operating pattern. And you have to go into your brain and make some, some big changes to how you think and how you see the world and how you understand how things work in order to make these things change. I needed to learn and to teach my subconscious and my body that it's actually okay to be powerful now. Not only is it okay, it actually benefits me. Being powerful means I can heal, means I have less symptoms, means I can make money, means I can have a big impact on other people's lives. But all of these things are only beneficial and I can only have access to them now because my environment is different. My environment has changed and my environment now supports me in power being not only beneficial, but also in alignment with my survival. So when I say some people don't want to heal or some people can't heal, like if I asked anyone that has a chronic illness, they would all say that they want to heal. The thing is, if you ask anyone, almost anyone, if you want to have more money, if you want to be a millionaire. Almost every single person would say yes. But the thing is, what we think we want and what we actually want are often very different. And we have to work on this, this deeper layer if we want to actually see change in our lives. So we have to work on this deeper level. We have to work on this level below our conscious mind. And one of the best ways we can do this is with shadow work. So with shadow work, what we're doing is instead of just taking yourself at face value, instead of saying, so for example, look at me. It's basically, who do you think you are? So you'd say, hi, I'm William. I wear glasses. I I like dogs, etc., etc., etc. It's who do you think you are? And then what we do, so let me give you some more examples. I could say, I'm into health and fitness. Let's say like, oh, I really like health and fitness. And what you then do is take all of these beliefs and see if they actually fit with your behavior. See if your behavior aligns with this perspective that you have on yourself. 
see if your perspective of reality is actually accurate. So for example, I use this example with many of my clients. So if, if, you're, if you've ever done an Illumina session with me, you've probably heard this example. If you have somebody that says they like dogs, they say they're an animal person and they like dogs. You go out with them to have coffee. You know, you sit at a restaurant, you're having a coffee and then this little dog comes up next to them and you're thinking, oh, they like dogs. So this is no problem. But they see the dog get close to their leg and they, whoa, they jump, they panic. They start trying to shoo the dog away. They start getting scared. You can see that they say, that they like dogs. But when you observe them, when you observe the behavior, when you observe the way that they actually behave, there's a big split. There's a big rift in their conscious awareness of who they think they are and who they actually are. So this is the conscious, the subconscious. So they think they're this person, but they're actually behaving like this person. And what healing this looks like is either changing your conscious awareness. So instead of saying, I love dogs, I'm a dog person, you would come down to here and you would say, I'm actually terrified of dogs. They scare the out of me. Every time a dog comes up to me, <laughs> I go crazy and I lose it. This is alignment. This is integration. Or we can go the other way around. So we can work on this traumatized aspect of themselves that doesn't like dogs and change their behavior so they actually do like dogs. But usually when it's this way around, it's never like whoop. Normally it's more like, like this. They kind of meet in the middle and then maybe they raise together. So because you can't work on your fear of dogs, if you're still identified with liking dogs, you kind of have to at some point acknowledge, so this would be acknowledgement that maybe I don't love dogs. Maybe I'm actually a little bit scared of them. And instead of coming down here and like, I'm terrified of dogs, I'm never gonna like dogs, this is my new reality. It's more like, yeah, I kind of don't like dogs. I'm a bit scared of them. It's really interesting to observe this behavior, but I do want to like dogs and I'm going to do some rehabilitation and some gradual exposure therapy. And I'm, oh, I like dogs now. And then the dog comes up to lick them and they don't, <laughs> they're just like, oh, and they like, let it lick their hand. And so take that example, but apply it to healing or to other areas of your life. So for example, you can say, I like money or I, I want to be wealthy. Do you behave like a wealthy person? Do you even know how wealthy people behave? Because you might have this kind of split, but it might actually just be because you don't actually know how a wealthy person behaves. You might think that a wealthy person does X, Y, and Z, and you do X, Y, and Z. So you think that you're doing the same thing that a wealthy person does. When in reality, a wealthy person doesn't do X, Y, and Z. They do A, B, and C. And you're like, oh, interesting. Maybe I'm not aligned with that. Same is true with healing. I see this over and over again. And in my experience, this is the most valuable perspective that I offer clients in a one-to-one -one environment. I think maybe this also comes off in videos as well. But let me know. You tell me what you think. And that is that healing is an energy that already exists. It's not something that you have to like invent. It's not something that you have to create or discover. Like, it already exists. You know, if you wanted to, this might be a breakthrough moment for some people, but you could literally go on the internet and you can find a million different people that have healed different and various health problems. Like they exist. I mean, I know I know many of them. I am one of them. People have healed, you know? I had chronic constipation. I would go for a week without a bowel movement. I would go for 10 days without a bowel movement. And then I would have the hardest, driest stool and bloody hemorrhoids. And I have a bowel movement every day without a problem. I have no constipation anymore. I've healed it. I used to have arthritis in my joints, in my wrists, in my ankles. I don't have arthritis anymore. I used to have chronic fatigue syndrome. Right now my energy is actually in a bit of a dip, but I used to have chronic fatigue syndrome where I was bedridden and I literally could not get out of bed. I've been to the gym twice a week for the last two weeks doing high intensity exercises, lifting heavy weights, and I feel good and I'm recovering. I've healed. So the point that I'm trying to make is not, I'm not, I'm not trying to show off and be like, oh, look at me. The point I'm trying to share with you is healing is an energy that exists. It's already here. Just like people say like, oh, gratitude is always available. You just have to tune into it. Or what would Jesus do? Or like choose love or like, I'm saying this in a, a little bit of a sarcastic fashion, but it's actually true. But the point that I'm trying to emphasize here is the energy of healing is already exists. You don't have to invent it. You just have to figure out, you have to look at, just as I was describing this split that can happen with the dog, like healing is an energy that exists. It's already here, but maybe you're here. So maybe what you need to do is, um, I'm not really aligned with healing actually. Maybe I'm like here. And if I want healing, I need to start doing things differently. And these things differently could be physical things. They could be thinking about problems differently. They could be seeing the world from a different perspective. They could be working on this judgment piece that I've described. It could be anything in between, but the point is healing as an energy already exists and you're existing over here. It's like, where are you going to go? Are you going to tune in with healing or not? Because I'm, I'm telling you, it already exists. This is what I was trying to say. I think the most valuable thing that I offer in my coaching and maybe, and, and this is what I'm asking you, does this come off in my videos as well? That healing already exists. 
You don't have to invent it. And all I'm trying to do with, with everything that I do, with the video that I'm making now, with the say 400 plus YouTube videos that I have created, with the PDFs that I have made, with the books that I have written, with the group coaching projects that I have used, that I've done in the past. All I'm actually trying to do is to show you what the energy of healing is so that you can bring yourself into it. I'm trying to bring you into the energy of healing. That's my whole job. That's my whole life. Cause th that's all I do as well. Cause through the same parallel, abundance exists, wealth exists. But if wealth is here and you're here, you need to do an adjustment. You need to come up to wealth or you need to change your identity and say, okay, well, maybe I'm actually not in alignment with wealth. Whatever it is, you know, I've, I've, I honestly, I've figured out the healing part. I've figured it out. I've cracked the code. I know what healing is now. Now I'm continuing to explore these other various energies that I want to align myself with, like freedom, like abundance. I did a core values exercise. One of my core values is abundance. I can do whatever I want. If I can't express healing on this call when I, when this is what I had planned, I'm gonna do something else with that. I'm gonna put this energy somewhere else. And here we are. So where do we go from here? Tell me about your struggles. Like tell me what's happening in your life. I'm trying to share to help, but I can help you a lot more if, if I know what's going on in your life. I'm giving you that example, you know? Facebook as a platform, what does Facebook want? Facebook wants to make money. That's why Facebook exists. Facebook wants to make you scroll down your feed as many times as possible so they can pop up as many of those little adverts and then it's ching 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 Ching, ching, like they make a bit of money each time you do it. So they want to keep you on here. If I, as a content creator, create such interesting content that everyone wants to watch and everyone wants to stay on the Facebook platform, Facebook's going to say, take this guy's videos and send them to everyone. Like everyone on Facebook needs to see this guy's stuff because if they see like he's going viral, his stuff is keeping people on the platform and ching, we make money. So the reason I can come to that conclusion is I know how Facebook works. I, I have an understanding around business. I know how Facebook is monetized because Facebook is a business. Facebook is a company. And I know that that's what they want. So if I want to be successful, see myself as a successful cre content creator on Facebook, this is what I need to do. And what have I been doing? I've been here. I've not been creating content on a frequent basis. I have not been delivering value to the people that are on my page. I've actually had a bit more of a focus on YouTube and my YouTube algorithm is doing great. You know, it's crazy. We're over 2000 subscribers now. Like hooray. It's amazing amazing but it's kind of come at the cost of neglecting Facebook and it's like well you can't just then expect to open a Facebook live stream and have a million people appear you know because sometimes I run live streams and I have 10 20 30 people but that doesn't just happen like magically there's like a practical process that gets you the desired outcome so you need to align yourself with it there's a really interesting book called it didn't start with you it's about family constellations and one of the principles in the book is that the words that we use they're not random, they're very specific and that there's a deep healing that can be found if you can look at the specific words. I'm just trying to reconcile with this illness I have. Reconcile seems like a very interesting word choice there for me, which makes me like, so as a practitioner, I'm like, that's an interesting word. I wanna learn, I wanna know more about that. What is the subconscious process that's happening that caused you to use that word? So I just searched reconcile definition on Google and it says to restore friendly relations between. Very interesting. Also, reconcile, this is in context with accounting. To make one account consistent with another, especially by allowing for transactions begun but not yet completed. Very, like, so interesting. Such interesting word texts here connected to this word. So let's look at this first sentence, reconcile. To restore friendly relations between. So what this is saying is you are trying to get on good terms with this illness that you have, which to me, the fact you use that word makes it sound like you're not on good terms with this illness that you have. And personally, my, my view has been, has become that our illnesses are actually parts of ourselves. They're parts of us. And they're actually holding a lesson or an experience or something that we need to process or understand to move us from our current perspective of how we see the world towards our higher version, towards the version of ourselves that we could be. The versions of us that actually have the things that we want, you know, whatever that is, like lots of money, a really like beautiful relationship, great sex. I'm not judging you, like whatever you want, you know, you want to be a billionaire like good for you you want to go and swim naked in the ocean cool like i don't really care but you know like on a soul level what you actually want out of life and i find that our illnesses can come because they're holding these like key components that we need so it sounds like there's a part of you that you're on bad terms with we need to restore good terms with and if we are able to do that some healing is going to come 
as a consequence of that. So something that I find helpful when, especially when we're working with like negative mindsets, negative emotions, negative feelings or experiences is our energy naturally is expansive because we do, we create, this is just the natural energy. Like if you are alive, you are expanding. You know, if in nature, if a plant or a tree or something, it's either living, which means it's growing or it's dying. The fact that you are living means you are growing. You're still growing out. So it's very hard for us to go from a negative to a positive. And a lot of the time our symptoms or our health conditions, they feel like a negative, especially because like they hurt or it feels like something's wrong, or they're uncomfortable, or we don't like them, or they're just here all of the time, and it's like, just give us a break, like, go away. Like, I've had enough, just give me a holiday. And it can feel really overwhelming. I find that to go from neutral to positive is impossible. It's not even worth trying. What I find really helpful is to try to go from negative to neutral. And the best way to do this is literally to just look and to just do nothing. So to try to attempt to observe a meditative state of neutrality. For example, let's say this is really hard, especially when we have symptoms in our body like pain. Like you might have a pain or maybe you ate a food and you're having a reaction or whatever. Like your brain is like, you feel the pain. Your brain is like, something is wrong. Something is wrong. Something is wrong. Your brain is just keeps getting pulled towards this this site of pain or this site of inflammation because we feel like there's some feedback coming from a part of our body. Like the alarm bells are going off, like do something, do something, something's wrong, you have to do something. And sometimes we actually don't need to do anything. Sometimes we just need to look at it and allow ourselves to return to a neutral state. I was having some really severe heart palpitations the last week or so, like to the point where I nearly went to the emergency room. Like I was having some crazy heart palpitations. We're talking like 40 palpitations in a minute. You know, I was laying down and my heart's like, doof, doof. You know, and it was like, what is going on inside of my chest? And it was really scary. And I can even remember I ran to my osteopath and I was like, I'm gonna die. <laughs> and it was really scared. And we did a treatment. I was like, can't you do anything more to like make it like stop doing that? And he's like, no, you're in process. You're not gonna die. And I was like, fucking great. That's really the assurance that I need right now. You're not gonna die. Like, great. <laughs> I went home and I sat with it. I sat with my heart and it was going all crazy and it was really scared. It was holding a lot of fear. And just by staying with it, I worked through so much stuff and I wasn't trying to. All I was trying to do was just feel the thing, just feel the thing and keep listening to it. I have a Reiki level two qualification, but you don't even need a Reiki qualification to do Reiki. All you do is you get your hand and you put it where it's hurting or where the symptom is. And you use this to bring your awareness there. So on my heart, feeling it. And I was learning what it was trying to teach me. And it was showing me like, my heart's really blocked. I'm really closed up. One of the big messages, like you need to put more personality into your work. You know, people don't just care about the information. People actually like you as a person. And I was like, huh? <laughs> Why would anyone like me? <laughs> you know, and it, it just shows you like this wounding, like this subconscious belief pattern I have of just intrinsically an unlikable person. And you stay with it and you're like, oh, that's a really interesting belief that I have about myself. And this is affecting me in these behaviors. Like this is making me not show up authentically. It's making me show up as more of a, a facade as like, oh, I need to over-exaggerate all of this information because I want to come off as intelligent and that will make people like me. But it's like, actually people like you just by you being yourself and you being, being real and being vulnerable and being honest. I would say this is a pretty advanced osteopath specialized in a lot of visceral and uh, fascia work. You know, like some of his treatments for me, like he would get his hand and he was putting it on me, like in my, where my kidneys are and like on my feet. And like, he was like almost not even touching me and he was moving like this you know that was the treatment it was like it was crazy it's like such a delicate treatment it was very very interesting he has like some very advanced levels of craniosacral therapy and visceral and fascia work he's like in his 60s like late 60s one of the most advanced people i've ever worked with really really interesting yes maybe you need an osteopath what i would suggest is whatever it is that you're dealing with we need to try and reconcile so the first step is try to restore friendly relations my first thought is instead of looking at this as being a broken part of you or a part of you that needs to be fixed we need to come at this with kindness and with love and we need to see this as a part of you that needs help a part of you that needs support a part of you that needs to be taken care of and then we need to do that accordingly and if that means going to see an osteopath then then you need to do that if it means eating a different way if it means meditating and sitting with it like it was for me when I sat there and meditated with it my heart didn't stop having palpitations it kept doing it it didn't worry me so much because I knew what the message was and it was like I'm gonna keep heart palpitating until you can show up as your authentic self 
until you can stop blocking yourself. So it's like, okay, I'll go and do that. I'll go work on it. Thanks, heart. And I took that message. But the second part that I found here that I found really interesting, make one account consistent with another, especially by allowing for transactions begun, but not yet completed. What this tells me in some level is you're in a process. This is a process that's happening, begun, but not yet completed. So a part of this reconciliation may be in seeing that this is not what your life is going to be forever. You're not going to have these symptoms forever. This is a part of your process. This is a part of the process that has begun, but is not yet completed. And maybe that in itself provides some reconciliation in itself. But the first part here, make one account consistent with another. I think it's about giving and receiving with your body. I have a feeling about that, but who knows? I mean, there is a level of serendipity, you know, the fact that I even picked up on that word and then these are the definitions that Google has. Maybe this is exactly spot on, maybe it's not, you never know. But anyway, this is healing, like learning how to look at a sentence of what someone says or of what you say yourself. And like, that's an interesting word, I should look into that. You know, when I was sick, one of the things I had was this pain in my eyes and I'd always say it felt like I had barbed wire in my eyes. That's a really interesting terminology. I've had other people say things like razor blades dancing in my stomach. That's a really interesting way of saying that. You know, you could just say my stomach hurts. Razor blades dancing in my stomach. Wow, that's so vivid. That's such a vivid description of something. I've heard some really interesting things, you know? The words that you use are really important and they're like a portal into your subconscious mind. And those portals can be portals for healing. So I think I'm gonna wrap it up. So I hope you found it really interesting and helpful. Let me know if you need anything and let me know if you go to an osteopath and how it works for you. And that's everything for me. But take care and I'll see you soon. Bye.